now. Okay, so as I was saying, and I don't want this to track my face. How do I turn that off? Okay, is it still doing it? Shoot, yes. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who are going to watch this and be like, why is it tracking your face? That's going to make me so, uh, like, ha um, woozy or whatever. I'll try not to move too much. Y'all know how I am though. Um, I'll try to take that off, figure out how to take that off tomorrow. <laughs> okay. I want to talk to y'all about something. So on this past week, I posted a video and the video was about, what it looks like to really belong to Christ. And um, there were some arguing things that happened, not, not just like on the comments, but also um, in my private messages. <laughs> there was a lot. And so we're going to talk about that this morning, and we are going to tie it into Exodus, and we are going to tie it into John, and we are going to talk about what it looks like to actually follow Christ and why that is such a blessing from God, okay? So that's what this morning is going to be about, and we're still going to be in our scripture from the Bible recap reading in a year because it literally aligns perfectly with what we need to talk about, okay? Okay. Yes, the camouflage jumper, Joseph. Dear God, I come to you today and I ask that you would please just, man, show up in spite of me, God. I I don't want to speak if it's not your truth. God, I am not here for me. I am here for you. Don't bridle my tongue if it's not true, God, and, and speak where it is true. God, there is so much deception there's so much deception among the church and among believers, God. And I just, I want to know you and I want to people that I, I teach God to know you, to know the truth about who you are, God. We want to know you. God, since the very beginning, you've been a God that wants us to seek you and dwell with you and see your face and experience life with you, God. And I pray that we can do that to bring you glory, God, and not for our own prides, but so that you can be glorified and honored. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we are. God, have me by the cross. Okay, so on... This past week, I had some things happen, and God was like, he woke me up. That's where that video came from. It was like God slammed me in the face with some stuff um, and woke me up and was like, it was really like, a, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? It was like this thing where it was like God just like, and I'm not going to tell you about the thing because that's private, but it was like God woke me up and was like, what are we doing? Why do we believe all of the things that we believe about God? Like, why do we say that God is just one piece of himself? And then we have all these Christians that were just patting on the back that have no life. Look, Christians that are we're patting on the back that have no life that reflect following Jesus and wanting to be sanctified more by him. And what we're doing is we're patting them on the back and we're saying you repeat it where you repeated a prayer and you went to the altar and you're good. And what we're doing in that, y'all, what we're doing when we do that is we're telling them that the whole entire New Testament talking about what it looks like to live with Christ is not true. We're negating every fact of what the New Testament says it looks like to actually live with Christ. We're saying that only John 3.16 is true, but not the rest of the chapter. We're saying that only... Only part of Romans is true. We're saying only that Galatians 3, take that whole chapter out because it can't be right. What, what happens is that we, we don't seek the truth of God for ourselves. And trust me, I, I have been there before. I have been that person who it just thinks that as long as I know who Jesus is, and I've professed that I know who he is, then I have to know who he is, right? Like that's, that's what we do. That's, that's what we do. And I actually have a husband with a very similar testimony. He repeated a prayer at a young age. And for years, people would confirm in him that he was saved. And he struggled so much with actually coming to Christ because of people who claim to be Christians 
confirming in him that he actually belongs to Christ when he wanted nothing really to do with living for Christ. And so I, I literally watched that unfold in his life. So when I stand on this ground this morning telling you that I come humbly to say, Hey guys, the church, what are we doing? What are we teaching people? What are we what are we teaching people? Living life with Jesus is beautiful. Living life with Jesus is is so beautiful and it's wonderful and glorious and the reason why I feel like so many people in the church are struggling is because we don't believe that God can actually change things now. It's not just about an initial faith with him. That initial faith enacts a whole lifetime full of goodness from God. And it's not about the physical external things. It's about the internal things that he works in us. And guys, if we believe that you can submit to God, belong to him, believe in him, and your life not reflect a life living for Christ, I'm not saying you're going to mess up. Trust me, I do all the time. I, and you have to, the difference is, is when you mess up, oh, you know it. Because the Holy Spirit is like, excuse me, no, 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 that's not who you are. You just worked out of your flesh and you belong to me now. So I'm going to need you to, to regroup. I'm going to need you to repent and I'm going to need to turn that for good because you just messed up. And so it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means that when you walk with the Holy Spirit, at, I mean, immediately the spirit is like, uh, 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 nah, -uh. we, we don't act like that. You know, that, that, I don't know. It's that, it's that guy. Um, he's really funny. He's a comedian. Anyway, I posted a video about a long time, but it's a, it's like a, cap cut trip template or something that's going on and where he's like uh, 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 uh. no that's what the holy spirit does when you walk with him that's the whole kevin hart yeah that's the whole purpose of work of walking with the holy spirit is that he walks with you that's the whole thing and so um Anyways, this morning, we're going to read a lot of scripture. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, the dad's there. Yeah, we're going to cover a lot of ground um, because I want you guys to know my heart. You're my people. And I feel like a lot of people um, are are like, what did you mean by that? Like all, all this kind of stuff. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. Okay. But if I don't tell you my conviction and tell you the truth, then I'm lying to you and I'm not following what God has literally laid out for us in scripture. Don't take my word for it. Read scripture for yourself. That's how I found it because I was always told that as long as you believe in Christ, everything else is just going to work out. And then Jesus over and over again is like, Hey, Count the cost of my discipleship. When you believe in me, when you put your faith in me, I want you to count what it's going to cost you. And we do that all in a moment, right? Like it all happens in a moment. Like realizing who Jesus is, is realizing who Jesus is. Like he's not just this guy that I can nonchalantly believe in. Like he is the savior of the world. Holy cow. And it all happens at one time. And then your life is like, oh, I'm running after that dude. He just saved my life, you know? Okay. So here we go. We're going to start in um, Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 through 16. That's where we're going to, that's where we're going to start. Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 through 16. I got so many things like barely hanging on to my desk right now. Um, okay. This is where I want to start because we are reading a book this morning. I mean, not this morning, this month about don't give the enemy a seat at your table. And we're going to kind of see how that pieces together in scripture. And it's going to be really cool. Okay, so Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 through 16. This is the making of the table that will have the bread, um, the bread on it in the tabernacle. OK, it's called the um, bread of the presence. I'm pretty sure. Um, verse 10 says he also made the table of acacia wood, two cubits in its length, a cubic in its breadth and a cubic and a half in its height. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. He made a rim around it, hand breadth, width and 
made a molding of gold around the rim. Wide, oh, oh, he cast it, he cast for it four rings of gold and fastened the rings to the four corners of its four legs. Close to the frame were the rings as holders and the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table. He overlaid them with gold and he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table. It's plates and dishes for incense it, and it's bowls and flagons, which were to with, with which to pour drink offerings. Lots of words in there. Basically, I'm reading that to say the table is finished, right? So this table that they are going to take 12 loaves of bread for the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are going to sit it on this table the day before the Sabbath. Um, every week, they're going to make fresh bread, put it on there for the Sabbath, and then the priest would eat this bread um, like whatever the other six days of the week. Okay. So if Sabbath is on Saturday, the priest would eat it Sunday through um, Friday. And then Friday they would make new bread to put back on the table um, as like a, um, a food off offering like bread in the presence of the Lord, right? So this was the Lord's bread. It was considered holy. That's why only the priest could eat it after the Sabbath when it had been given to the Lord, okay? So um, we're going to pause and we're going to flip on over to where we are in our book and we are going to read Psalm 23. Psalm 23. All of this scripture is going to come together. Y'all just bear with me. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Guys, what do we do when we love people? What do we do at Thanksgiving? What do we do at all these different things? Culturally, we have always went and ate with people that we care about, right? Me and my parents did that yesterday. They came to my church, visited my church. And so what did we do after? We went and ate around the table and we sat there because it's an invitation to dine. It's an invitation in. It's been that way since the beginning. God set a table in the midst of the tabernacle with bread on it because it was his food. Not that he needed bread because the priest was going to eat it after, but it was a reminder to them. Truly, uh, I didn't look this up, but I'm uh, I'm thinking y'all can fact check me on this. Um, I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit that he's guiding me right now, but he sent manna from heaven to remind the people that he was in control, that this was his presence with them, that he was going to provide for them, to sustain them. And so now here we are in the, the tabernacle and he's putting bread. He's requested that they put bread in the presence of him um, on this table saying, hey, for the one loaf for each of the 12 tribes of Israel to say, hey, I sustained you then. I'm sustaining you now. You tried to mess it up. I'm going to keep my promise. I am going to be your provider. I'm going to be your sustainer. I'm going to be the one who keeps you and shields you and walks with you. I am the guy. Like, I am your God. I am him, right? I am who I am, that's my name, Yahweh. And so God is God has always centered discussions around dwelling, dining, table. He sets a, pre, a, a table before us in the presence of our enemies, not, a, not away from our enemies, in the presence of them. What does the Bible tell us? Pray for those who persecute you. Like, hey, go to God on their behalf, but we don't let them sit down. That's the difference. We don't let them sit down and dwell with us in between us and the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. I want to talk to y'all really quick about Exodus chapter 33. And I meant to make all weekend, I've been meaning to make videos in Patreon about this stuff. But when I tell y'all, I really spent a lot of time in my Bible because this weekend I was ready to delete everything. Like, God, I'm out. 
mm -mm, I'm not, mm -mm, I'm not doing this anymore. And God was like, I was driving home from getting my groceries on Saturdays after being ripped apart by several people in my private messages. And, um, I was like, God, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like, man, people are mean. And, um, I just felt him so heavily. And he was like, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me? Or are you going to let them hinder what I'm trying to do in your life? Because my truth is my truth. The way is narrow. People won't understand. And if they rejected me, then they're going to reject you. You just might as well get ready for it. And I was like, you're right. You're right. And then something else would come. And the, the enemy would try to sneak in again. And then I showed up for Sunday school and we talked about it again. And then I showed up for church and we talked about having peace in the midst of trial instead of peace outside of trial. God doesn't give external peace. He gives internal peace to those who believe in him. And I was like, all right, Lord. I just kept like writing notes on pieces of paper to Dustin saying, man, this is timely. Man, this is right on time. Man, God is like really hammering in, in, in on me today. And so. He does that. He shows up and he's like, this is what I, this is who I want you to know that I am. I'm the God who sees you. I am with you. I am going before you and I am keeping you and sustaining you. So I want to talk to y'all about Exodus chapter 33. God has always wanted to dwell with his people. That's why he made Genesis. That's why he even made us to begin with is to bring him glory and honor and to dwell with us, to dine with us, to have a relationship with us. That's who our God is. That's who our God is. Whew. And um, in Exodus chapter 33, verse three, it says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff necked people. Verse four. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. Okay, this was Saturday's reading, I believe. So here's what God showed me through that. All that that we read in 1 John and Galatians 3 and all of that about how God changes us from darkness to light and he can't dwell with people who continually live in sin and who reject him. It's still in the Old Testament, too. Our God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The reason why he is telling Moses this, which we know later, Moses goes on the people's behalf and is like, please, God, no, you made this promise. Please go with us. Like, go with us. Don't just send an angel. Like, we want you to be with us. Like, please, God, please, you. We want your presence. And if you're not going, I'm not going. Because I want to be right here where you are. I don't want to be with all of them. Like, I want to be in the middle of you, not with them, not with just somebody you send. I want to dwell with you, God. And so Moses makes intercession and God, God listens to Moses. Not that God had to change his mind. He was likely just testing Moses's faithfulness to see if Moses was going to, to, you know, make that plea to God. But anyway, that's beyond the point. So he says, lest I consume you for your stiff necked people. These are the people that just created a golden calf because God was taking too long giving Moses the commandments on Mount Sinai. The, these people is who God is talking about. And you know what the issue was? Is that they were worshiping an idol besides God. That's always the issue. It's always an idol that God has an issue with. It's not that he can't redeem sin. It's who we worship. It's what we worship. It's the part that we put our life into and our love into. And guys, there's only one thing that can take that place. That's why the Bible says you can't serve two masters for you will love one and whatever to the other. I can't remember the full verse right now, but he's like, you can't serve two masters. They're going to be at conflict with each other. There's only one capital L ORD of your life. And it's either going to be money or whatever you else you want to fill in that blank, or it's going to be me. But I can't be in the presence of you if it's any other thing because 
I will consume you. I'm too holy. I can't not dwell with my people. I want to be relational with you, but but I can't be in that place with you if you're not going to put me as the master of your life, as the Lord of your life. And hold on if you think that this is leading to work-based, because it's not. I do not believe in work-based salvation. Let me make that very clear. Jesus redeems. Jesus saves. He died on the cross. It is his work, and it is finished. But let me tell you something over and over and over again in scripture. Let me just say, what a sad gospel. What a sad gospel. If we believe that all we do is believe and God changes nothing else about our life. What a sad truth that is. Why would that be worth telling anybody about? Yeah, just believe in him. But but he's not going to change you until you get to heaven. Yeah, yeah, you got to believe in him. He's really a holy God, but he can't he can't sanct- he can't work the sanctification process this side of heaven. He's not going to lead you closer to him or show you more about him this side of heaven. Like you're going to have to wait for that because that's only going to happen in heaven. You just got to believe and then, you know, God's just going to let you do your thing and then then, you know, like when you get to heaven, that's when everything's going to change. And let me tell you something. We are not fully sanctified until we get to heaven because we live in this fleshly body that's tainted with sin and it's yucky and it's gross. And we mess up all of the time because we're at this war all the time with each other because God has given us a spirit to be able to walk in his truth. And so sometimes we like, you know, we kind of try to like veer off the path and, and the Holy Spirit's like, no, nope, we ain't doing that. We're not doing that, sis. We are not doing that, sis. Why does it keep asking me to verify myself? We're not doing that. And so here's the deal. The reason why 1 John is so true is because we have too holy of a God to dwell in somebody who is living in darkness. We have, he's too holy, y'all. He's too holy. That's why we're called sheep. Because we're dumb and we mess up. And that's why we need a shepherd. That's why the shepherd has a hook. Because he's got to latch on to our neck and snatch us back. Because sheep are dumb and they will make the wrong decisions and they need a shepherd. That's why we're called sheep. It's not because we're like cute and fuzzy. It's because we need a shepherd because we cannot make right decisions on our own. That's why the Bible says, I go before you. I am you're making your plans prosper. I will work all things for good. It's talking about God there, not you. Guys, if you believe that you can do anything good on your own, you have been sorely mistaken because we mess everything up everything we mess up. It is only by the hand of God that we are able to live in the truth of who he is and walk in the fullness that he's called us to walk in. And let me tell you something. I believe in a God that doesn't keep you the same way he found you. I can't tell people about God keeping them this not. I can't tell people That all you have to do is believe and you can stay the exact same and still know Jesus because I have encountered him for myself. I have seen him. I work in my life. I know what it looks like to feel his voice guiding and leading you and leading you to the path of righteousness and still waters that he promises he will do. And so I'm not going to, you will not get me to back down on telling somebody that when you believe in Jesus and he gives you his Holy Spirit, because you truly say, God, I I am turning from my sin and I cannot stay still. Because I have seen your goodness and I will run after it. That is what salvation is. Hey, salvation is saying you're walking this way. You know, you're on your own like little path of sin. And God, hey, God calls you because it's God who does the work, right? And so God is like, hey, 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 you're a sinner and you need some grace and you need some mercy and you need some love. I want you to follow me. And you know what you do? You say, hey, God. I guess I can't. I can't. You know what we do? Do you know what we, you know what? I'm about to say this, and this may even blow some of y'all's minds even more. We can't even turn ourselves around, you guys. We're on this path, and we're like dead set. This is the way we're going, and God calls us out of that. You know who turns us around? Jesus. 
because we're walking this way towards everything that we are, we want in life. And you know what God does when we say, Hey, I can't, I'm sorry for who I am. I am sorry for who I am. God, I need you. I'm sorry. I have heard your voice and I don't want to be this way anymore. I want you. And I believe who you say you are. And I know that Jesus is who he is and that he died on the cross for me. And you believe that with all of your heart. You know what God does? He turns you around. He turns you around. And But here's the thing. When God makes that move in your life, he's not going to leave you standing in the same place. He's not going to leave you standing there. He's got too much in store for you. He didn't call you just to stay still and comfortable with just being gripped out of hell. And I'm not trying to create fear in anybody. This is the most beautiful part of the gospel that God doesn't leave you how he found you. I don't want to stay the same. If I believe in a God who is sovereign and big and mighty and holy and all of those things, I I expect to be changed in his presence. I expect something to change. I expect to experience beautiful peace, love, mercy, goodness, kindness, gentleness, all of the fruits of the spirit. Do you know how we get there? Because when God turns us this way, it's going to be a really bumpy road. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy because your flesh is going to be trying to yank you back. But this looked really good and shiny, God. And God's like, no, we're walking this way. We're going this way. You got to trust me. We're going this way. I know, Ashley, you want to delete your social media because people are mean. Guess what? It's going to be hard. We're walking this way. Hey, Ashley, I know you wanted to stay in that job because the extra $1,600 a month was paying your bills. Hey, we're walking this way. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me? Because we're walking this way. Because I've called you for more. I've called you to bring me glory. I've called you for purpose. I turned you around, not so that you could stay the same. I called you to walk with me and believe that I am who I say that I am. He loves us too much to leave us how he found us. All right, John. Actually, let's talk about Moses for just a second. Then we'll go to the book of John. In in Exodus chapter 3, we see Moses for the first time encountering God. You want to know what he did? (laughs) He hid his face. This bush is burning and Moses looks that way and God starts talking to him through the bush and Moses hides his face from God. That's in in Exodus 3 chapter 6. He hides his face from God. Then God is like, hey, this is who I am. Throw your staff on the ground. It turns into a snake. And Moses runs from the presence of God. He's like, wow, there's a snake on the ground. Okay, comes back. Next thing we see in Moses' life, he doubted the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 4, when he's telling God, hey, I'm slow to speech. I can't do this. And God's like, hey, I made your mouth. Don't tell me you can't. I'm the one who created your mouth. Don't tell me you can't go and talk to Pharaoh. I made you for this. I had this purpose in mind for you all along. You're going to have to trust me. So Moses doubted his presence. So then God made a way and was like, I'm going to send Aaron with you. Which turned, which anyway, we won't get into all that. But he sends, he sends Aaron with him to be his mouthpiece. Because God's going to make a way. And then now. What do we see in Exodus 33 verses 12 through 23? I'm not going to read it, but we see Moses requesting that God's presence go with the people of Israel because Moses doesn't want to be anywhere that God is not. He's like, I don't want you to send an angel, God. I want you to go with us because I'm not leaving unless you go. You're the God that I serve. I'm not here. I'm not here just to experience a piece of you. I, I actually got, hey, God, will you show me your face is what Moses says. Hey, will you show me your face? Will you show me your glory? And God is like, I can't. I want to. I want to show you my face. I want you to see me. But I can't, Moses, because you can't be in my presence. I'm too holy. I'm too holy for that. You're still living in this flesh. 
you would drop dead, Moses. I can't. You're, I'm too holy. And so here's what God does. Here's what God does. He says, he says, hey, this is what I'm going to do, though, because I appreciate that you're seeking me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk by you, but I'm going to cover your face. I'm going to cover your face. I'm going to walk by you, but I'm going to cover your face. Sorry, YouTube. Y'all are seeing like my dolls I got from my grandmother. Um, She passed. So they're very, they're very special to me. I know some people are like triggered, triggered by dolls, but he's like, um, I, I'm, I'm going to cover your face because you can't see my face and live, but I'm going to cover your face. But when I walk by you, I'm going to uncover you and you can see my back <laughs> because I want to dwell with you. That's what I created you for. It's just right now you're still caught up in this fleshly body. And so you can't see my face and live, but I got a purpose for you left. So I need you to keep going, but I'm going to let you see my back because that's the God that I am. And I appreciate that you want to see me. Guys, that transformation in who Moses is, is crazy from chapter 3 to chapter 33. From hiding his face to requesting to see God's, holy moly. And it's because he walked with God, he understood who God was. He was he was getting confidence in who the God was that he said that he was. That's what happens to us. I'm not saying the moment that you get saved, you are going to be like, send me wherever, like, you're not going to, you're not going to fully understand. That's why sanctification is a process you walk through. It's why that trust God's like, keep seeking me and you will find me. You, you will learn throughout your, your walk with Christ. The more that you seek him, the more you feel like you've got to know about him. Like he's so big, but you also start to hear his voice more and more and more and more clearly. And he reveals yourself. He reveals himself to you more and more and more, just like he did to Moses. He is sanctifying us in this process, right? He's he's moving us towards the day when we are fully sanctified in him, right? In heaven. So here we go. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read John chapter. We're going to go through John chapter six. I don't even know what time it is. I think we're running behind this one. And I'm sorry, but. <clears throat> This is too important. It's too important not to. And I'm not watering down the gospel to tickle people's ears because if I do that, I'm responsible. One of the things that was said to me was um, to much is given, much is required. Man, that cut me to my core because I don't think you guys understand how much, how serious I take this. And probably still not as serious as I should. But man, I pour a prayer over you guys all the, all day long. Hey, can I tell you something? The people that can hurt you the most are the people that claim to know Christ. And I'm not saying this person doesn't know Christ. I don't know that. I don't walk walk with her in daily life. I don't know. But the people who, who can hurt you the most are the people who are Christians. Because it's not supposed to be that way. had another situation yesterday got super hurt by some friends guess what Uh, it's okay if they don't invite you Jesus does can I tell you something Uh, extend the grace that was extended to you even when it's hard even when you don't want to Because people are mean, man. And the enemy will twist things that people do and say to make it seem like nobody is for you. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. It does not matter if nobody on earth wants to be your friend or support you. If you know Jesus, that's all you need. I'm not saying walk away from the church. 
the truth of the matter is most of the church needs people who really love Jesus because they don't know what that looks like. Your family, they need people who love Jesus. Don't walk away from them. Your church that's hurt you, they need people that love Jesus. Don't walk away. Man, I'm sorry. It's been a it's been a hard couple of days. Um so what happens in John chapter six, we're we're tying this back into the bread and the table. So what happens in John chapter six is you know what, before we read this, I want to read John 3, uh, 16 through 21 to y'all. Because for all of my life, I was only preached John 3, 16. John 3, 16, that's the way to salvation. And it is. However, if Jesus tells us to count the cost of discipleship, what are we doing if we don't read the following verses? Right? So let's read them. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send... Okay, back up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Hold on to that. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. We're condemned by our own sin, our own rejection of him, because he is not believed in the name of the only son of God. Our rejection of Jesus is what condemns us to hell. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. From day one, day one, A one, as people say, Adam and Eve, they loved knowing that they could be like God versus just trusting God for who he was, right? Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed but whoever does what is true comes to light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God if you are going to try to convince me that salvation is belief in Jesus and nothing else changes after that I'm not going to take your word for it friend I got eyewitnesses here I have eyewitnesses and a Holy Spirit guiding me through Scripture telling me that, hey, when I save you and you really know that I am who I say that I am and you believe that, I'm going to change some things. You're going to walk with me. That means you're going to look a little bit more like me every single day. I'm not going to leave you the same. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to just get, let you be comfortable and sit down on your couch and rest and say, oh, no, no, no. Hey. That commission, go and tell the world about me, go and make disciples of all nations, that is a requirement of all people. That's not for the preachers. That's not for the missionaries that we like to just send money to. That's your mission too. That's the whole reason we're still here. Go and tell people about me. Every person, tell them about me. Let my spirit guide you. He will lead you to truth. You don't know what part of somebody's story you walk in on. You could see the fruit of salvation. You could water it. You could plant the seed. But I'm going to bring the harvest, God says. The harvest is mine. That's God's. That's our mission, y'all. God will change things. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. I don't want to I don't want to worship a God who doesn't change me. What good is that? I don't want to stay the same. I want to look more like him. If he's who he says he is, then he will do that. John chapter 6. Jesus feeds 5,000, right? He gives them bread. We're tying all the bread in together. And then he goes away. And then he comes back and he walks on water. And now here we are in verse 22. 
It says, on the next day, the crowd remained on the other side of the sea where they had been. Only one boat there. And Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples. Um, we're going to skip this part. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Verse 35 of John chapter 6 says, Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. See, in the verse before, they're like, hey, sir, can you give, give us this bread always? Can you feed us? Can you take care of providing for us? Can you do that? And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. <sighs> Spiritually, not externally, internally. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Hey, that's where we get, that's where we get the, hey, when you're saved, they ain't gripping you out of your father's hands. Hey, when you really go to Jesus, mm -mm, ain't happening. You may struggle with some things. You may still have some sin in your life that you've allowed to become a part of your life. And so now you're going to have to deal with those things with God, but he will justify, sanctify, and turn those things for good. Hey, hey, they will never cast them out. The people that really believe in me and belong to me, they're mine. They're mine, man. Uh-uh. You can't have them. That's that's my people. I love them. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. God, Jesus was on mission for God. He's literally submitting to God himself. Why do you think you don't have to? That's my question. Where where in the world have we gotten this? Hey, God is only grace. He is grace and it's amazing grace, but he's not just grace. He's also just and kind and loving and wrath and jealous. He's all of these other things too. But we say once the cross happened, God is not any of those other things. But if he's not any of those other things, then he can't be in Revelation. Because if you've read that part of the story, there's a lot of things that happen that are not just about grace. I'm so passionate about this, y'all. Man, I lived lukewarm for too long. Which means useless for the kingdom of God, by the way. Lukewarm doesn't mean like not hot or cold. It means useless for the kingdom of God. Useless, meaning you don't know him. You can't be used of him because you've not really submitted to who he is. You've not really trusted that he really is the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh of your life. It means, hey, I can't use you because you don't even understand who I am. You've not given me your life. I want to do more with it. You can't hold on to it yourself. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Everyone who believes in Jesus, really believes in Jesus, really believes knows that he is capital L O R D. Hey, do you know what's different about the belief that Christians have? It changes things. You want to know why I know that? Because in the Bible it tells us even the demons believe and they shudder. There's a different kind of belief when you allow him to be the master of your life to lead God and direct you. There's a different kind of belief. Verse 41 says, "So the Jews grumbled about him." Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say now, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Hey, God does the work first. We love because he first loved us. He comes to us and draws us first. Verse 45 says, it is written in the prophets and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. 
Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, let's see. Then G- then Jews had then the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, "How can this man give us flesh to eat?" <laughs> hey, you remember what I said in my video what got what Jesus would say? He would tell them, "Hey, drink of my blood and eat of my flesh or you cannot be my disciple." <laughs> well, this is one of those stories. <laughs> Then Jews, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. He is with you. He is with you. He becomes a part of you. He leads God and directs you. The Holy Spirit is with you. God, Jesus covers your sin through his blood and his flesh and his work on the cross. And what that means is when you truly take in who Jesus really is, it changes things. Verse 57, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Hey, that that live right there. Verse 57, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. Hey, that live is eternal life, but that live is also today. You will live in light of who just saved you from your sin. I'm just going to leave it there because God's got to do the work. And what I'm learning more and more about the scripture is that so many people, man, so many people are so deceived. They're so deceived and we can't change that. God has to. All we can do is speak truth. And maybe, maybe God will allow it to be watered. Maybe it will come to fruit. But God does the work. We can't. Their response is not our responsibility. Our obedience is. And guys, I just want to tell you, it's not popular. It's not popular to, to, to follow Jesus. It's not going to be. Really follow him. Not just the bumper sticker Jesus on the back of your life. It's not popular to follow Jesus, but I'm telling you it's worth it. And there's too much at stake not to. There's too much at stake not to. Do you think if I didn't believe this, I would be telling all of you guys this? No, because I tell my son the same thing. And I love him more than anything. And I'm going to tell him the same thing. Hey, baby, you can't just repeat a prayer. That's not all that there is. You got to really believe that he is who he says he is. Sure, if the prayer leads you to that point, great. That's wonderful. But hey, you can't, you've got to really put the Lord at the center of your life. And when you do that, when he turns you around, you're going to chase after him, man. And I'm not saying you're going to mess up because we're not perfect. And sometimes we try to act out of our flesh. But the difference is God will speak to you and yank you back and say, that's not what I've created you for. Stop that. And you will stop. I'm going to tell my five-year-old the same thing. Because I want to see him in heaven. Not that I'll know that he's my kid, but I want him to go there. He's been given to me. Y'all, the the people, the 268 people on this live, God gave me a responsibility to tell y'all the truth. And that's what I pray for. And I I hope that y'all know how seriously I take that. Because I love you guys. And we're on mission for Jesus. And man, we've got to seek the truth of who he is. I don't want to know anything but the truth about who God is anymore. I am sick of hearing all of this. God is just love. He's not just love, y'all. He is love, but he's not just love. And Jesus changes things. 
He doesn't leave you the way he found you. Dear God, I come to you today and I just want to, man, my heart is heavy and my thoughts are running wild, God. And I just pray from the bottom of my heart, you get the glory from this. I don't know who will listen, but you will. You do. And I don't want a single ounce of the praise, God. It's all for you and your glory. Uh, Because I would love to quit, but I can't because you're too good. You've been too good to me to save me from my sins. God, I love you. God, be with anybody today who is struggling with what it looks like to follow you who is in the midst of trying to figure out what it looks like to surrender to you, God, help them. Help them understand that the entire New Testament is written for us and that you change things. Your presence changes things. You love us too much to leave us. You're too good and too holy. To encounter us and leave us the same. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I love you guys. And I just want y'all to know I love y'all from the depths of my heart. Y'all go and shine the light on Jesus today. And we will be back in the morning at 4.30 a.m. on TikTok five on youtube so i love you guys and i'll see y'all tomorrow bye youtube fam i love y'all and i will see y'all tomorrow